Welcome everybody to the 2016 BYU Football Media Day. I'm Lauren Frankham. I will be your host for the remainder of the day for a stellar lineup of web chats. But first, we are here with Trevor Maddich from ESPN from the 1984 National Championship team. Today, coming up, we have, uh, let's see, Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins from the 1996 team, followed by Shea Muirbrook and Ed Lamb. At the end of the hour, we have Tim McTire and Omar Morgan. Join the conversation at any time using, using hashtag BYU Media Day. For our supercast at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, we have State of the Program, 12 p.m. Eastern Time, to our BYU Sports Nation at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. We have BYU Football 1996 Revisited. And at 10 p.m. Eastern Time, we have BYU Sports Nation, a 1996 special. I'm having a hard time talking today, Trevor. That's a lot of numbers, Lauren. It is a lot of numbers, and it's early in the morning. It is early in the morning, but I, you're doing much better than I would be doing with those. Thank you. I'm usually just getting up around this time, but you're usually wide awake working. I'm usually getting in, right? in from last night around this time, so, so okay, that's not exactly true. So you're still living in Franklin, Tennessee, which is near Nashville. Yes. How's the budding singing career going? Uh, the budding singing career is still slow, considering okay. that I'm not a singer. But, uh, <laughs> but if you ever see me on an album or hear me on the radio, you'll know that they've run completely out of singers. Oh, and So that's why, wow. I'll be, although I have, I have sang and played an original song, two of them actually, at the Bluebird Cafe. Have you really? Yes, I have. How did you get into that? It was, That's hard to do. That's I was where, bigger like... than the doorman. That's why I just said, you're going to let me sing. <laughs> no, actually, the Bluebird is a place where, in, uh, it's near Nashville. It's a place where um, a lot of people have gone to get their start. Some very big names. But every Monday night, they have open mic night. And that means that if you have enough talent to write your name on a piece of paper and throw it in a basket, they'll pull it out. And you can go sing one of your own songs. And so I, I was very nervous about it until I heard other people sing their songs. And I was like, okay, this is not going to be so bad by comparison. So it was, a, it was a real joy and a real thrill to be able to, to do that. But I am not, not a singer. So. I, I think you are a singer. If you're putting your name in that hat, you got to be some type of singer. A, you have to have a, some confidence in your singing ability. It's a bucket list thing. It's a bucket list thing. But it was, it was a whole lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, there have been a lot of changes in this offseason with BYU football. What is, what is the national media talking about right now when it comes to BYU football? I think there's a lot of excitement because now Bronco Mendenhall and his staff did such a great job of, of elevating BYU football. And now there's excitement that Coach and this staff, Kalani Sataki, and all the people that he brought in, Ty Detmer, all those guys, will be able to take it from the level that it's at now and elevate it to a new level. There are a lot of reasons why they can do that. And I think that nationally, there's a lot of expectation that they will. You talked about Kalani Sataki moving this to a new level. Bronco Mendenhall had a great tenor here at BYU. What do you think Kalani Sataki can do to move it to that next level? Well, the thing that needs to happen is they need to continue to bring in better athletes. And I think Coach Sataki can do that. He is the kind of a guy that is respected because of who he is, not just because of what he does or because of the demand of respect that he puts out there. He's a guy that's been out there mentoring young coaches, high school level, college level, et cetera, going to the, to the camps and not just being there and going home, but staying there and developing relationships. And those relationships, I think, are going to really pay off big when it comes to recruiting here. And all it takes is another two or three guys that they don't lose to a Power Five conference that will allow them to elevate from where they are to the next level. Ty Detmer, the former Heisman Trophy winner, brought him in as his offensive coordinator. What do you think that's going to do for the program? Uh, I think that brings a lot of credibility. You've got a guy that's been there, done that. You've got a guy that's won a Heisman Trophy. And you've got a guy that in the NFL had a reputation for mentoring starting NFL quarterbacks when he was there as, a, as a, an active quarterback on the roster. He was a coach in the meeting room. Even coaches would listen to what he had to say and adjust their game plans and adjust their style when Ty Detmer said, Coach, there's something that we need to alter here. And so he brings that kind of credibility. I can tell you this, that, that I know a lot of former and current NFL quarterbacks and quarterback coaches. And every one of them that I talked to had gushing, wonderful things to say about Ty Detmer's ability to not just understand football, but to teach football. And I think that bodes well for the future here. For these current players, like we talked about, there have been a lot of changes in the coaching staff, new offense, new defense. What are going to be some of the challenges for these players with so many changes? Well, learning the offense and putting it against the schedule that they'll have. Learning the defense and putting it against the schedule. And that's the hardest part because people forget that just learning is one thing. But now there's another guy on the other side of the line 
that wants to hit you in the mouth as soon as the ball snaps. <laughs> and that complicates applying what you're learning. And there are a lot of complicated things relative to what they'll be doing, especially on offense. But I know that they won't overdo it at first. That's one great thing about having Ty Detmer as the offensive coordinator. He understands that it's better for guys to learn what they can learn and then play it fast rather than give them too much and have them overthink it. It's the same way with the defensive staff. They understand that playing fast and knowing what you're doing is a whole lot better than having too much to, to think about too early in the process. And so I think the, that's going to be the, the challenge for the coaching staff is to learn how quickly players can assimilate how much information. Robert and I ran the go fast, go hard offense. Ty Detmer is more of a pro style. What's going to be the benefit of this style over, the, over Robert and I's? Lauren, the, the go fast style of offense, which is all over college football now, is designed to run 90 plays. And they want to go as fast as they can go, run pass option, and they'll have maybe eight or nine or ten bad plays in there. They don't care. Maybe the defense will be set up in a way that's, that's the defense has the advantage pre-snap. That's okay. Run the play. We'll get it again later. We'll make it up. We'll run so many. Huddling up, you have the opportunity to make every single play count because you've got more options for the quarterback. You've got more time to get together, communicate, get different personnel into the game. And when you line up in a pro-style offense, now all of a sudden, instead of run pass option, go, 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 you're looking at what the defense is doing. And now you're applying your knowledge to what the defense is doing every single time. And so that's, that's an advantage. And once this gets fully installed so that the players can run it well, it'll give them an, an advantage that the go-fast offense doesn't have. You were an offensive lineman on that 1984 team. Louis Lapuajo from this year said, huddling after every play feels like a big piece of chocolate cake for him. <laughs> from the offensive lineman's perspective, what are, you, what are some of the other benefits of this type of offense? Well, you get together and look each other in the eye in the huddle, and there's a lot to be said for that. Now, keep in mind that BYU will huddle, but there'll be times when they won't. They'll have different tempos. But I think BYU has always been able to recruit big, powerful offensive linemen. I think going back to a pro style maximizes that ability. They're also able to, to recruit quarterbacks, linebackers, you know, interior run-stuffing defensive tackles. It's been just sort of a history of BYU that way, and I think what they plan to do on defense and what they plan to do on offense maximizes their historical advantages in recruiting. We have Taysom Hill and Tanner Mangum coming back. If, if you put yourself in the coach's shoes, what do you do this year? Well, I can tell you this. I talked to Coach Sataki, and he said the only way he knows how to do it is to put it on the field and let them battle it out. And that is the only way the players can really respect it. If there are politics involved, there are certain advantages to that. But at the end of the day, players then think, okay, I've got to play the political side in addition to the football side. But by doing it this way, what everybody respects who will win. And who will win will be the guy that the team also knows should be the guy that's playing because no matter which guy is chosen to start I expect the other guy to play but no matter which guy is chosen to start you've got to understand that it's still a team thing and the team has to buy in and by having it be a battle instead of looking at off the field considerations the team will buy in because of the nature of that kind of competition. BYU has a, a lot of personnel uh, player wise coming back this year what are you most excited about? What position group are you most excited about? I'm most excited about the defensive backfield. With Kai Nakua and the rest of them, you've got, you've got as maybe the fastest defensive backfield in recent memory and the deepest defensive backfield in recent memory. And that will really help because when you lose a pass rusher like Bronson Kafusi, all of a sudden you've got to find some other guy that can individually go get after the quarterback. And with Warner and some others, they've got guys that they think can do that. But with the secondary being as active and as fast as they are, They'll give more time for those pass rushers to get after the quarterback. So there's a lot of talk right now of the Big 12 expansion and BYU being one of those teams that gets included. But I guess, I guess now that's, there's not much talk of that expansion anymore. But what would you like to see happen to BYU and the program moving forward? It's best for them to be in a Power 5 conference because we don't know going forward what, uh, how college football will be consumed. I mean, the way media is changing right now with, with untethering of cable stations from cable packages, et cetera, people think about the future of, of consuming sports as what device do you watch it on, your TV, your phone, your, your tablet. But to me, it's more who will you buy it from? 
I mean, will it continue to be this model where you've got the major broadcasting networks that then provide to the cable companies, et cetera, and then to their own apps? Or will conferences and then schools do what BYU TV has done in a way and sell directly to consumers? Will there be a pay-per-view model? Will there be a, a, a model where you'll buy a conference or a team's home games or, or something like that? We don't know where it's going. The thing about BYU and what BYU brings to a, a Power Five conference is that it is truly a national brand. And it's not just the LDS community that looks at BYU. College football fans in general have realized for several generations that if they turn on the TV and the game's on and that Y's on that helmet, it's going to be an exciting game. And they're going to want to watch it to the end because BYU, you know, if, even if they're trailing, they're going to come back. And so that national brand bodes well for an uncertain future in terms of how people will consume their college football and their live sports because BYU will always have an interest mm -hmm. to people who want to watch and are interested in good, exciting college football. On the BYU side, what they need is to be involved with, with the big programs so that wherever this does go, they hitch their wagon to, to a lot of other big, powerful schools. Trevor, thank you so much for being here with us. A lot of really good insight. Um, coming up next, we're going to be talking to some of the stars from the 1996 team, Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins. But first, we're going to go down to Jason Shepard, who will be our social media correspondent. Jason. That's right. We are so excited the BYU Media Day is finally here, and we're also really excited to be able to add some coverage Man, as part I can't of our BYU today. Media Day Supercast. One of the things we're doing as the social media correspondent, we're putting the spotlight on you, the BYU sports fan, and we want to find out what you're talking about throughout the day here on BYU Media Day. So my job is throughout the day to follow what you're talking about, topics that are trending for you, if there's an interview that piques your interest, whatever you're talking about on social media, that's what we want to find out about. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Make sure that you got to remember these hashtags. This is really important all day long. Anytime you tweet or use social media in general, make sure you're using these two hashtags. Hashtag BYU Media Day and hashtag BYU TV Sports. And there's a lot of things we can do with this. Not only can we see tweets that come in, but we've got a couple of uh, Twitter questions. I actually posted a Twitter question about an hour ago with so many interviews coming up today. And you've got plenty of opportunities to hear interviews. You have the state of the program coming up at the top of the hour at 11 o'clock Eastern Time, 9 o'clock Mountain Time. We've got all these interviews, and so I threw out a Twitter question. What are you most excited to hear? Who are you most excited to hear from today and why? And the, the first tweet that I got back was in from uh, FinDaddy81. He says, Jamal Williams, always a great interview, but I want to hear about what he went through last year and how that has made him better. I know everybody is super excited to have Jamal Williams back in the fold for BYU, not only uh, from a media perspective, because he's a great interview, but for what he's going to bring to this team to kind of solidify what, the, what this team can do on the ground. But as I mentioned, we're going to be following your tweets all day long. Don't forget to use the hashtag BYU Media Day, also BYU TV Sports. And besides just following your tweets, you can actually get interactive with our guests today, with all of our web chat guests. And just this hour, we've got Shay Muirbrook and Ed Lamb, Tim McTire and Omar Morgan as well, plus coming up in just a few minutes, uh, Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins. If you want to ask them a question, you can do that. Again, use the hashtag BYU Media Day and BYU TV Sports. As I mentioned though, Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins are standing by with Lauren Frankham. Let's head back upstairs to the second floor of the BYU Broadcasting Actually, they're, they're actually getting things set up. But as I mentioned, you've got a lot of opportunities to hear from a lot of people today. Not only the state of the program with Tom Homo and Kalani Sataki, you're going to have a lot of players throughout the day. BYU Sports Nation is going to have a two-hour special from noon Eastern until 2 p.m. Eastern time where they'll have Kalani Sataki, players, coaches. You're going to have an opportunity to hear from a lot of people including a special this afternoon on the 1996 Cotton Bowl team. But as promised, let's head back up to Lauren Frankham. She's standing by with Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins. Lauren? Thank you, Jason. It takes a while to get all mic'd up and get our, our stuff ready and get going. We are with Chad Lewis and Ronnie Jenkins from that 1996 Cotton Bowl team, arguably the best team in BYU history. How would you guys argue that you were the best team in BYU history? Chad, we'll start with you. We were a tough team. 
No, we didn't go undefeated, so I'll have to oh, I will always give the 84 team credit for being the best team because they did it. They went undefeated. But our team was uh, top to bottom, side to side, pound for pound. We were a tough team. We were talented at every position. Um, we had guys that wanted to compete. So Ronnie came in as a freshman in 96 and blew the doors off of the whole place. And so when you have a good team, it's very talented. And then you add people like Ronnie with those kind of skills, his speed, his vision, his practice ability. Now we got a really good team. So that was a fun year. Ronnie, what would you argue? I mean, I would have to agree with Chad. Uh, it's hard to go against a team that went undefeated, but uh, top to bottom, I mean, our tight ends were the best in the country. Um, we had a, a, a very, a really good quarterback, Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, our corners were, were awesome. Uh, I mean, our running backs, it was three of us. I was the youngest one, Brian McKenzie and uh, uh, Mark uh, Atawaya. Uh, we were good. I mean, it's hard to, you know, it, I, it, it's always, you always say what, what we could have did, but it's hard to go against an undefeated team, but I would pick our, our team over any team. Guys, it's been 20 years. It's kind of weird. 20 years <laughs> since you guys were on that team. To put things in perspective a little bit, the number one song in 1996 was the Macarena. Were you, was that one of your guys' jams? <laughs> were you doing the Macarena? You know, the first time, I, Steve Young had some of us go down to Lake Powell, and I remember waking up to the Macarena. <laughs> and when I, when I hear the Macarena, I think Steve Young, Lake Powell, that whole group just, <laughs> just jamming, you know. Uh, but it's weird that it's been 20 years. Yeah. Ronnie, Crazy. What, what was your go-to jam in 1996? You know what? At that time, fresh out of high school, <laughs> you know, I was into hip hop, rap, uh, so probably was various artists. But uh, that song right there wasn't wasn't one of them. I, I heard it a lot, <laughs> obviously, but it the wasn't, Macarena wasn't on your. Nah. What did you have? Did you guys have CD players? Man, yeah. we had Cassette eight tapes. tracks. Eight tracks. Okay, <laughs> I I didn't know when that no, transition took place. that was CDs. Place. It was yeah, CDs. Okay. <laughs> Come on, Chad. That's awesome. So, Chad, you were in the NFL for a while, now working at BYU as an associate athletic director. Update us and update the fans a little bit on your life, your family, and what's okay. going on. Uh, married to Michelle, who is an All-American volleyball player here. We have seven kids. Our oldest is 6'4". She plays volleyball on the, on the team here. Um, I work as the associate athletic director for development, which means I'm the director of the fundraising team for the athletic department. So I work with Robbie Bosco, Lee Johnson, great team. Um, it is so fun for me to be back here. I didn't want to come back to BYU and work because I love BYU. I didn't want BYU to become a job. But since being here, Tom Homo is the one that said, hey, we need you, come back. And since being here, I, I just, I love it. I run to my office every morning because I love it. So it's cool to be here. And, and to have Ronnie and the rest of the 96 team come back here, this is a dream come true. And not a lot of people could say that about their job, so yeah, that's, that's a blessing for you. Ronnie, you were the WAC freshman of the year. You were in the NFL as a successful kickoff returner for a while in the CFL for a bit. And what are you up to now? Right now, um, I do a lot of training with kids, uh, athletes in my area. Uh, so I have a, a, a small space where we just train athletes, a, a bunch of other guys from my area that made it to the uh, to the pros. We all just came together and uh, we lease a spot and we just train kids from Pop Warner to high school to college and just get them ready uh, for their sport. So you you stuck around the sport too. Yeah, you I guys have to. can't leave. Yeah, you can't leave it alone. It's hard to leave, you know. This is what I've been doing for most of my life, so yeah. it's hard to just go do something else that you're not accustomed to. Right. So. And it's something you love. Yeah. Football is kind of weird because you practice as a little kid, junior high, high school, college, pros, and that's your marketable skill. That's what you know more than anything else. And then, boom, they say, okay, thanks for playing. Go do something else. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of look around like, what? Uh -huh. This is what I'm good at. This is what I know. This is intuitive. Um, and that's why so many guys go into coaching. So many guys are in training or athletic departments because that's what we know. That's, that's how we were trained, and it's kind of interesting to be just taken to that cliff edge and then, okay, go do something else. <laughs> right, especially when there's so much hype around the team, so much hype around the players, and then you graduate, and it's like, see you later. See you later. I know, it's weird. Yeah, that'd be an interesting thing. So, let's talk so when we talk to the younger guys, one of the things we say is prepare for the future because the future is now. Education is your plan A. 
get your education. Education isn't plan B. Football is great, but your education is where it's at. So, so one thing Vice Sikahema says all the time, which I love, is make football work for you. You don't work for football. Make football help you open doors and, and attack life. And I think, that's, I think that's the right mindset when it comes to football and education. Make football work for you. Ronnie, what advice would you give current players? I would have to concur with Chad. Um, education is number one. Um, you don't want to ever be in a situation where you, re you realize that after it's over. You kind of want to take, uh, um, take advantage of your opportunities. You get, you get to go to college, uh, you focus on your school and football, and, and let football be your, your, your outlet to, to, to get out there and, and uh, make moves and, and uh, market yourself and stuff like that. But education is, is where it's at, because um, after football, you got to do something, you know what I'm saying? So uh, I would just tell any kid uh, to focus on that and not just stay so into football. Like I, when I was a kid, I was just football, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of education was my second, yeah. my secondary. But as I got older, I, I learned. So um, I would just preach education over anything. Let's talk about that 1996 team for a little bit. Like Ronnie said, Chad, two of the best tight ends in the nation. When you think of that 1996 year, what offensive moment sticks out to you the most? For me, it's the first game we played Texas A&M in the Pigskin Classic. It was a preseason game here in Lavelle Edwards Stadium. Um, when Texas A&M played BYU before, they trashed us. They separated uh, Ty Detmer's shoulders, both of them. And going into that game, like that catch right there by K.O. Keala Louis sealed the deal. It was a it was one of the sweetest balls that Steve Sarkeesian ever threw. It was against man coverage. Um, and then wrapping up the season with this Cotton Bowl victory, that team was uh, impressive for so many reasons. But I like that first game where we came out and we, we smacked Texas A&M, um, and then we, we just kept rolling through the whole season. We, we dropped one against Washington, which still haunts every one of us. <laughs> but I love that Texas A&M game, coming out fighting, and that was a great start to that season. Ronnie, one of the biggest question marks coming into the 96 season were the running backs. And you came in as a freshman behind Brian McKenzie. What do you remember about stepping onto the field for the first time as a freshman that year? Um, I mean, getting here, my mindset was a little different because I was coming off of a high of, I mean, I broke a national record in high school. You know, I was getting a lot of attention. So to come here, I was hungry, came here, but it was different, you know. I, I never been a part of a real program, uh, a, a, a real winning program. I never won uh, too many games in high school. So getting here and in that first game, I thought I was ready to play, but I wasn't ready to play, you know. And I'm glad that uh, Lavelle and Norm Chow brought me along the way they did because that crowd and playing in front of 60, 70,000 people was just a different experience. Um, but it was a it was, it was a great thing for me. I learned so much. I learned football. Uh, I learned what a team is and just a lot of things. Just, I just learned football, and I'm glad that they brought me along the way they did. Let me, can I say one thing? Yeah, about please. His, he came, he rushed in one game in high school for about 614 yards, something like that. So it was <laughs> a team game. in one game, which is wow. freaky. That was the national record. Freaky. So when he came, we were wondering, like, okay, What's he going to be like? Was he playing against chumps? The first practice that he came here, he lit practice up. His practice ability, it's hard to have great practice ability out of high school. And I would say two people in BYU history are the top shelf of practice ability players, Austin Colley and Ronnie Jenkins. So his first practice, he would take a run and he would bust it for 40 or 50 yards. He would run back to the huddle and do it again for the entire practice. And I think in that first practice, he got in a fight with someone. Um, and all of us <laughs> were looking at him practice, like, Ronnie. okay, he's hungry. <laughs> he knows how to practice. He's going to be a superstar. And I like, like Ronnie said, Lavelle and Norm Chow brought him along the way that was comfortable for him. So they didn't say, okay, first game, text the name, go, you're our guy. They let him develop. And when he came on, he came on so strong that it lifted our whole team the rest of the year. Ronnie, really fast, one last quick question from a fan wrote in. 
he said, you were known as the fastest guy on the team. Who gave you a run for your money? What other guy on the team gave you a run for your money? Uh, I mean, I, I don't or wanna... nobody. Well, I mean, James Dye was, was quick. Um, but, you know, at that time I was so, you know, cocky with my speed and just, <laughs> I was just so, you know, I was just, I wasn't really thinking about that. I just felt like I was probably the fastest guy on the football field, but you know, whatever. He's the fastest human in the state of Utah. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much what I've heard. I was 10 years old during that game, but I, I do remember watching you guys and you were pretty incredible. Guys, thank you so much yep, for being here. You. you guys are thank fantastic. You. Coming up next, we have Shea Muirbrook and Ed Lamb. If you want to join the conversation, use hashtag BD, BYU Media Day. Stay tuned.
You're watching the 2016 BYU Football Media Day web chats. I'm Lauren Frankham. Join the conversation at any time using hashtag BYU Media Day. We are here with two stellar defensive players from that 1996 team, Shane Muirbrook and Ed Lamb. Guys, how are you? Good, good, good. Thanks for having us. Good to see you. It's been 20 years, just to let you know, since that 1996 team. How crazy is that? Is that weird to think it's been 20 years? It doesn't seem like it's been 20 years. I know. Ed? Looking at these guys, I mean, it, it seems like yesterday in a lot of ways. But, yeah, there's uh, the 20 years is, is a long time. We just think about <laughs> it taken like that. Time flies. Yeah. I want, there's a couple things I want to talk about. First of all, Shay, in your headshot, you had some bleach tips. You had some bleach tips. What, what was the inspiration behind that hairstyle? Uh, just uh, just uh, being independent, you know, <laughs> just um, experiencing – you know, young adulthood and, you and understand. Yeah, there you go. There it is. Uh, <laughs> Looking good. Looking good. Uh, yeah, back. those are uh, some of my uh, less, um, not the best choices, I guess, <laughs> back then. So, uh, hey, that was the style, though. You look good. Oh, well, thanks. You look good. Ed, you actually had hair. Uh, actually yes. had hair back <laughs> then. That's right. I had options, more options so, back then. A few more yeah, options. We had, we had a, full disclosure, Shane, I had a, a hairdresser roommate. So, no. yeah. yeah. Really? I mean, That's yeah, right. Carl. Yeah, to get. Uh, that makes sense. To get bleach tips was, you know, it's free and available and could always change back. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, because honestly, when I was looking at your headshots, I'm like, their hair. Uh, That's, That's like the first thing that stood out to me. I loved it. To put things in perspective, the number one movie in 1996 was Independence Day. The number one song was the Macarena. Oh, wow. Do you guys remember that dance? You don't have to oh, do it. Yeah, I think I remember something about that. Yeah. Yeah, Sarkeesian would <laughs> yell it every time we ran out on the field. He'd say, ah! <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I definitely remember that. Uh, as far as the movie, though, I don't remember. Um, it's a long time. Steve Sarkeesian legitimately yelled that every time he went out on the field? Yeah, if we, um, yeah, he would, he would. He would, yeah, do the, <laughs> ah, whatever that is, but he would, uh, he would yell it out from across the field. And so, um, yeah, we, I guess that was kind of the moniker. We just had a lot of fun uh, that year. What was the thing to do in Provo, Utah in 1996, Shay? <laughs> Tube in the river. Tube in the river was probably, uh, I don't know, for me, was one of the highlights. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Show, yeah, Shay and I were roommates and close and, we, we went through a lot of things that we thought were the thing to do. But that's a lot more wholesome, wholesome yeah. and enjoyable and, and great memories. Yeah, we tubed that river a lot. Uh, sometimes yeah. in between practices during two days, we'd go up and just sit in the river and cool off. And yeah, it was better than the ice tub, that's for sure. <laughs> it's not a bad spot during the summer. So you guys got to know each other very well since you were roommates. Shay, what is one thing about Ed that none of us would know? Um... <laughs> I don't know. You know what? Uh, I always thought that's what I admired about Ed is um, he's pretty straightforward. I mean, there's there's not a whole lot of whole lot of secrets with Ed. He's pretty stand up. And and that's always what uh, drew me to him as a, as a friend is he, he what you see is what you get. What about Shay? What's one same thing? question? Yeah, yeah, same question. <laughs> well, I don't know that I had a sense for it when when we were all together and around the guys, but um, you know, later in life, when people would ask me, it, the fans of BYU really felt like that, that Shea's on-field persona was who he was. And what we all knew was a, a sincere, authentic, great friend, you know. And, and I think sometimes, you know, the, the tattoo and the way he played the game so violently, they figured he was a guy going around punching people they were in they were the gut all the time. Him. Yeah, and he's not was not uh, scary in any way. You could count on him to perform in the games, but he was a great friend. Still is. Ed, you were a, sex, a successful head coach at SUU for seven years. Back here at BYU as an assistant head coach. What Update us a little bit on your life and what's been going on for the last 20 years. Yeah. Well, I think I'm like a lot of the guys here as, as I get catching up. You know, we're all trying to balance a, a career that's important to us. And we've got people counting on us and whatever our jobs are. But at home, we've got families, you know. And, and it seems like everybody's about in that same stage of families. And, older kids maybe getting ready to go to college and being excited about that and then I'm still I've still got some younger kids uh, too and I, so I, I think probably the update on my life is not all that unique and special. Shay so you joined the police academy 
Is um, that right? Well, no, not officially. Um, there is a, an opportunity that's out there, and uh, yeah, so we'll uh, we'll continue to pursue that. But that looks like that could be something that's on the horizon. Great. What what have you been up to the past twenty years? Uh, family. Uh, I've changed uh, quite a bit in in my um, in my attitude. Uh, I think that uh, once you settle down, uh, find that. Um, that sense of, you know, uh, commitment, you know, you, uh, you don't want to, uh, tarnish in it anyway. So for me, the, the biggest thing is, uh, is family. Uh, obviously my, uh, my wife, Megan is, uh, my strength and my support. And, uh, and I just go through life trying to make sure I don't do anything to, uh, to tarnish or, or damage that, uh, that trust that is placed in me from not only her, but my, my children as well. I love that. Unfortunately, we all have to grow up, right? One of the unfortunate things of life. Lavelle Edwards said of that 1996 team, it was just one of those years where it all came together. At what moment did you guys realize that this team was going to be special? We'll start with you, Ed. Yeah, I, can, I can remember in the, in the off season a, a couple of moments that I, I looked back on during the year. One of them was, uh, I remember Coach Reynolds was, was talking to a, kind of a small group of us and said, I don't know if you guys know how good we can be. And that just, I've always, that's, that struck me now uh, later, and I've tried to remember that as a coach, how it, he may not, he probably doesn't remember it, but something so simple as that, instilling that confidence in the guys. And then, um, you know, I, I can also remember hanging out, I remember uh, Steve Sarkeesian said, we got we to play almost perfect to beat Texas A&M, and it was kind of like, yeah, okay, let's do that, let's, <laughs> let's do that. And, and, you know, I mean, as well as we could have played, I think, I think we did in some of those real tight games that we pulled out. Shay, you have a long list of accolades from that year. WAC Defensive Player of the Year, Cotton Bowl MVP. You were inducted in the AT&T Cotton Bowl Hall of Fame. You were the stud, defensive stud of that team. So, you, And you had some, a ton of critical defensive plays. When you think of that season, what moment stands out you, to you the most? Um, to be honest, it's uh, when I'm walking off the field after the Cotton Bowl and uh, a reporter asked me something to the effect of, you know what I mean, your last game as a Cougar, how does it feel? And uh, I just said, I'm a winner. Um, that's, to me, that's the 96 team is there was, um, across the board, we were talented, uh, but the, the level of camaraderie and, and brotherly love is, is, is hard to touch on. Uh, it's just something that is there. It's hard to explain, but, um, for me personally, I, I think it's a tribute to the team and, uh, and the level of sacrifice that each individual made to that bigger cause. Ed, there's going to be around 50 guys from that 1996 team here today. Who do you think was the most underrated player of that team? Oh, underrated. What a great question. It would probably be the, be the specialist guys. I mean, uh, the... Um, I'll give you an example, uh, like, you know, James Dye, I don't know if you'd call him underrated. Everybody knows who he is. But I know that in our game against Wyoming, the Wyoming coach made a, a decision late in the game just out of fear of James. And he never touched the ball, but it, it, it completely changed the game. We would not have won that game if, if we didn't have just the threat of James Dye. And, and I, think, I think probably some of those efforts that, that went in um, on the special teams, the depth, uh, like on defense, we had uh, eight defensive linemen that, that played all the time, a ton. Um, that, that over the course of a 15-game season, I think a lot of those specialists and, and depth guys were a real key. And you're a special teams coach right now, so that's probably top <laughs> yeah. of mind as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope the guys are listening. <laughs> you're like, pay attention. Shay, what would you say? Who's the most underrated player of that team? Oh, uh, wow. Um, that... That's a tough question. I, I honestly don't think there was too many players that were, uh, I would say the whole team. And I think that's the, was kind of the mantra just because every player across the board had kind of played with a chip on their shoulder and had something to prove. Um, obviously we were all talented, but I, to, to single out one specific person and, and say, um, you know, we were, that person was underrated. I. I think that would be a slight because there was uh, there was tremendous talent across the board on on that team. Who are you guys? So you're going to be able to see a lot of your former teammates. Who are you most looking forward 
to seeing today? I know, I mean, I know that's probably a hard question because you want to say every single guy, but what guy are you most looking forward to seeing today? Well, for me, it was Shea. I mean, we, we, we spent so much time together at a, at a point in our lives like that is so pivotal and we're, we're growing and learning who we are and experimenting with who we are and want to be. And, and then we have all this, all these shared memories of, of success too, and, and good times. And, but in, in getting out and doing our things and, and chasing priorities in life, you know, we've, we've lost touch. And I, I don't, I don't think other than a, a few texts uh, over the last few years that we've really, uh, so I, I, I already made mention to him. I, I need your number and we're not going <laughs> to game without talking and you need to be up here every game that you can be. And, and so that, that for me is cool, but every guy I see, it's like now, you know, it's yeah. such, a, such a great moment to see him. Shay, you better say Ed too. Or well, yeah, <laughs> obviously. Um, well, we I mean, I think me and me and Ed have a, uh, a special bond. Like I said, I mean, we were we were roommates and and um, we found a, a lot of fun together here at uh, BYU. And, and um, so, it, yeah, obviously to see Ed is um, it's like uh, just not seeing a family member, you know, your brother for a long time, and then you're reunited. And um, but uh, obviously, I'm um, I'm thrilled to see every single person. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I I'm just elated uh, to be here and, and be in everyone's company. Guys, thank you so much for being here with us. I'm excited for that 1996 show. That's going to be fun to watch. Up next, we have a couple more of your teammates. We have Tim McTire and Omar Morgan. But first, we're going to go down to Jason Shepard, our social media correspondent. Jason. Thank you very much, Lauren. People are absolutely loving hearing from this 1996 team. And as I mentioned before, my job is to find out what you, the BYU sports fan, is talking about on social media. What, what's trending? And I have to tell you, since we've been on the air with these web chats for about 45 minutes, everybody's talking about those Nike BYU polos. Those are nice. I've got to find out where I can get one of those. I have always been a proponent, by the way, of mixing in a little bit of gray. But you get that royal with the gray, that's looking nice. That's certainly something BYU fans are talking about. And don't forget, if you're on social media, whenever you tweet, make sure you're using the hashtag BYU Media Day. Also, BYU TV Sports. And as I mentioned, people are really enjoying hearing from this 1996 team. There'll be a special later on this afternoon where they'll honor that team that went 14-1 and won and won the Cotton Bowl and finished the year number five overall. In fact, we got a tweet uh, just a, a couple of minutes ago. Uh, this one in from uh, Anthony Johnson. It says, the 96 team was amazing. They brought NFL speed and power to the season. Stoked to see them today. And it's interesting that he brought up the NFL speed. Not only was that a very good college football team, as I mentioned, 14-1, and one, finished the year number five, winning the Cotton Bowl, but that produced a ton of NFL products. A lot of guys, Chad Lewis, who we've already heard from, played in the NFL. I believe the number of players were in double digits off of that 1996 team. It was a fantastic uh, opportunity for those guys to go on and play at the next level. Uh, this tweet coming in from at BYU or Bust 64 said it would be epic if Sark made an appearance at BYU Media Day. And I do know that BYU reached out to Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, I'm not sure where that stands. I guess we'll all find out coming up in the next little while. But it would certainly be great to have the quarterback. And it was interesting when Lauren was talking to Ed Lamb and asked him about an underrated player. Um, it was funny he mentioned James Dye because the word I used for Steve Sarkeesian, and believe it or not, is underrated. In my opinion, he was probably BYU's most underrated quarterback of all time. Uh, this one in from at Shamo says, all the BYU media day buzz, already wishing I'd taken the day off to just enjoy it. So, so ready to have football back. And I think we can all echo that. But hey, here's the deal. We're, we're online. You know, we've got BYU radio, BYU TV. We're everywhere. You can kind of sneak that a little bit if you're at your cubicle. And I'm not by any means telling you not to work today, of course. But there are ways to, you know, put in the earbuds, listen, maybe watch. So there's a lot of ways that you can get around that, Shamo says. Again, not telling you not to work at all. All right, uh, we've got the state of the program with Tom Homo coming up at the top of the hour. But let's head back up to Lauren Frankham. She's standing by with Tim McTire and Omar Morgan. 
Thank you, Jason. And join the conversation at any time using hashtag BYU Football Media Day. Like Jason said, we're here with Tim McTire and Omar Morgan from that 1996 Cotton Bowl team, the no-fly zone, right? No fly zone. Guys, what made the defensive back so good in 1996? We'll start with Tim. Um, I think it was confidence. Um, the fact that uh, myself and Omar were both from the same area. Um, we kind of speak the same language a little bit. <laughs> And uh, it was confidence on top of a uh, great coach, Brian Mitchell. Um, we just had fun. What do you think, Omar? I, 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 I agree. I think um, coaching staff put us in some pretty good positions. But I, I think that the mentality we had was I was just listening to somebody downstairs saying that uh, Steve Sarkeesian was overrated and people, I mean, underrated. They said he was like, underrated. What? <laughs> you, you always hear BYU being the underdogs. Yeah. We never thought like that. We, uh, we thought we were better than everybody we played against. The 96 team, we felt we would, we would win every game. So we took that aura out on the field, and it just paid off for us. I think, I think part of confidence is style. Would you guys yeah, not agree? Definitely. Let's, let's take it back 20 years. Tim, what was your style in 1996? What were you rocking to school every day? Oh, what was I rocking to school every yeah, day? Yeah, what, what were you wearing? Bandana. Uh, had the bandana. <laughs> I, I did wear the bandana a lot, but I... I think I wore most of what was free, <laughs> you know, our, <laughs> our, 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 our travel issue. I tried to stay comfortable. See, bandana. Oh, yeah. oh, there you go. There's, there's something oh, of you okay. with the bandana. Oh, okay, we got the highlights going. Yeah. Did you wear that to every game? Did you have a bandana yeah. on every game? Uh, every game. That, that, was, that was my thing. Um, it kept my helmet tight, knowing that I was going to make a lot of hit tackles and hits, so I needed my, my helmet pretty tight. Tim, what was Omar's style back in 1996? Um, see, Omar, Omar was a different kind of guy, though, in some way. I was, I'm simple. I'm yeah. simple. Like, like, even when you watch the kids today, I coached last year, and you, you see the kids, they're doing too much before the game. The focus <laughs> is on what they're wearing, and, and, and it should be on how you play. But it didn't take us long to get dressed. Nah, it didn't take us it long. It didn't take us dressed. no hours to get dressed. Some of these kids today, it may take an hour to get dressed. It's like, really? You, you're wearing that to, to play football? And we... We had to fool, we had to trick Lavelle sometimes, you know. <laughs> I can remember the TCU game. How many interceptions you had that game? Two. How many times did your shoe come off? About five. <laughs> so, you know, Lavelle didn't like us to spat. He didn't like us to take our shoes up. So I know. Right there. there, there was, did your shoe come off right there? There was, a, there was one game we was real, we was kind of defiant. Uh, I taped up, he did not. And Lavelle called me over. He was like, well, what I tell you about that tape? Like Lavelle, you know my shoes gonna keep coming off, and it was lucky his shoes kept coming off, so I had an excuse like, see that's yeah, good. yeah. So that was that was kind of good. For and him. so he let you, he let it, he, he go let wide. it get away he because he saw his shoes keep coming off, and that was my excuse. Tim, you played a few years in the NFL. You were coaching the high school level in LA for a while. You put out a rap album uh, in yeah. 2006, and now are you are you a stand-up comedian still? Yeah. How's that going for you? Uh, it's okay. I'm not Kevin Hart yet, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's okay. It's fun. Um, that's the way I, I I let loose. I release that way. I get to do a lot of cursing, <laughs> <laughs> which you can't do here. Please. <laughs> no, I can't. So that that's how I kind of release a little bit. Omar, would you have ever guessed that Tim would become a stand-up comedian? Yeah, he was funny. The first day I met him, he's cracking jokes. He's always cracking jokes. Uh, Stand up, well, I don't know, but he was, he was always <laughs> funny and cracking jokes, so you can, so you can kind of see it. He does it now. He's over there cracking jokes now, so you can kind of see that. Omar, you had the game-winning interception in the Cotton Bowl. You were nicknamed The Blanket. You had a prolific career in the CFL, and you now own a few stores in the L.A. area, right? I own a store. A store. A store. I own a little market in uh, South Central L.A. I also coach this year. I coach my son's uh, football team, man. So uh, I've been doing pretty good. I, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. The nickname came from Chad Lewis. That's Chad. I don't know what it was what it was about, but he felt I could cover like you like a blanket. So uh, I did. They gave me the name and I just ran with it. Speaking of Chad Lewis, he said Tim McTyre and Omar Morgan were the best DBs in the history of BYU football. No question. If not for Tim and Omar as a package, there's no way we would have gone 14 and one. What made you guys such a dynamic duo? You know, um, my, my junior year here, um, and, and it's, it's not any disrespect um, to Dermell Reed. That means disrespect. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, but 
Music Omar was, was <laughs> for a small guy. Omar liked to get physical, um, and my junior year was kind of both ways, you know, circular. When Omar came, it kind of the first four games I was bored because they were testing the new guy. Once Omar showed that he can cover and was willing to tackle, it made us better. You know, there was nowhere you can really run. It was almost choose your poison. And again, I think we held each other responsible. Um, I know I was older by a year. Um, so I, did, I wasn't afraid to tell Omar, you know, let's go, vice versa. He wasn't afraid to tell me as a senior, like, you know, step the game up. And I, I, I think that we, we had a, we, we there was just something there that the cohesion, uh, and I think when you talk about DBs, we both played offense. Mm -hmm. uh, we were both offensive guys, and I think that's what really made myself uh, a, a good corner. And being a DB, I offense. understood offense. So when Omar came, knowing that Omar played uh, offense as well, and to see him do things on the opposite side of me, I was like, oh, okay, he gets it, and he understood that. And I think by both of us playing uh, offense, that kind of helped us out defensively. Omar, a fan tweeted in saying he got chills seeing your guys' name, the two of your names on the lineup today. What was the hype surrounding the team that year when you guys would walk on campus, walk around Provo? Do you have any stories of, of what the hype was like? I mean, it was kind of normal. We, cause we, I, I don't know how, I don't really recall how the fans were acting, but we expected to win. Like, we expected to win every game, so it was kind of normal to us. I, w I was here last year, and uh, I was telling some guys that I thought the BYU had a chance last year, you know, to go undefeated if Tyson was healthy. So, yeah. I, I mean, I don't like but BYU. In my opinion, has been holding on to this underdog role. I guess that mm -hmm. that makes us fight harder, and but I don't buy into it. I think like we're not underdogs anymore. That's yeah. the past, and. Who cares about that? I think like when teams play BYU, it's like, oh crap, we, we got to play. Mm -hmm. These guys are coming to play. The underdog role is cool for TV and media, but hmm. we never felt like that when we played. We have one minute left. We're going to do one more quick question. Tim, what do you miss most about playing football at BYU? Um, I miss the crowd. Um, I miss the stadium, and I, hit, I miss hitting people. <laughs> <laughs> You can't do that in stand-up comedy. You don't uh, hit people. Uh, you can. Okay. Yeah, but I, but you can't. I I definitely miss the crowd and, and hitting people. Omar, what do you miss the I most? I miss the crowd. I miss the fans. I'm intrigued by the community and the yeah. fans. So that does it for me. When you when you make a play in that stadium and people are roaring and they're happy and giving you high fives and thumbs up when you leave yeah. the stadium is great for me. Guys, thanks for waking up early, being here with me. Good luck in that 1996 show that's coming up. Guys, continue to join the conversation using hashtag BYU Football Media Day. Coming up next, we're going to have a special two-hour BYU Sports Nation and join more web chats with current players at 2 Eastern time. The current players. Jason Shepard, our social media correspondent. Thank you very much, Lauren. Great stuff so far. Don't forget, coming up at the top of the hour, it's the state of the program with Tom Holmo. Lots of great information. We'll see if there's any breaking news coming up uh, with Tom. Also, you'll hear from Kalani Sataki and everybody coming up uh, in, in just a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, let's get back to, uh, to social media. As a social media correspondent, I've been following what you, the BYU sports fan, are talking about. Don't forget to use the hashtag BYU Media Day and BYU TV Sports. Uh, this uh, next tweet coming in from uh, Ag Agro X Craig says uh, Tim McTire is killing it right now. Not only is Tim McTire killing it uh, on the web chats, he was one heck of a football player. Let's move on to uh, uh, another tweet. Uh, again, BYU Media Day is, uh, is the hashtag, at Y for life. Oh, I see, I saw this one a little earlier. Uh, this one coming in saying, I'd like a Jason Warren BYU TV sports shirt when this is all over. And I'll just uh, let you in on a, on a little secret. This is what I replied. I am equally honored and creeped out. Just kidding. I can't give up my shirts, though. I mean, I can't do that. Uh, at Caitlin Jenny, perfect way to start BYU Media Day with web chats and catching up with the 96 players. Excited to hear more coming up on BYU TV. Couldn't agree more. As we mentioned, we're going to be celebrating the 1996 Cotton Bowl team all day long. You're going to hear from players coming up. 
uh, all day long. We got a special at uh, 4 o'clock Eastern Time on BYU TV. You are not going to want to miss it. And don't forget, we've got web chats coming up again at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Now it's time for the State of the Program with Tom Homo.